Imagine yourself on board an airplane. Your ears hear the steady hum of the engines and air conditioning. Your knees feel the backrest of the seat in front of you. Your eyes see the cold cabin light that's too bright for a night flight. You open the shade and try to catch a glimpse of what's happening outside. The window is small, dirty, and full of reflections from everything going on inside the cabin. Now imagine you're a little kid again. You take the time to build a fortress out of blankets to block out the cabin lights. You press your face right up to that thin plastic window long enough for your eyes to really adapt to the dark and you enter a different world. Welcome to my world. It's the view from the cockpit where the windows are big and clean, the lights precisely attuned to the task at hand bright enough to show us the information we need, but dim enough to let us pick out the lights of our landing runway a hundred miles away. Now most of the time, we're not near that runway. Between tracking navigation, monitoring systems, and checking fuel burn, there's more than enough time to enjoy the view. It's the next best thing to being an astronaut on the International Space Station. When I was 10 years old, I got my first telescope. It was one of those wobbly department store things that barely showed more than the naked eye. But it was my wormhole to the universe. I learned to read star charts and tried to figure out which of those bright red points in the sky was the star Antares and which was the planet Mars. My mind expanded with a newfound spatial sense when I taught myself why the moon went through phases using piles of books my parents eagerly bought for me. I got the chance to grow up in a time with some of the most remarkable astronomical sights the sky has to offer. I was 12 when Comet Hyakutake graced the sky and 13 when Hale Bob awed people around the world. I traveled to the path of totality of the 1999 solar eclipse and saw two shooting stars each second in a 15-minute break in the clouds during the Leonid meteor storm in November of the same year. The solar maximum at the beginning of the new millennium made the sky glow with intense auroras rarely seen in Central Europe. I started taking pictures of the night sky, the techniques coming naturally because I'd been meticulously studying a book about astrophotography for two whole years before I even owned a camera capable of taking pictures at night. But the skies I lived under looked like this. Commuting between uptown Manhattan and a New York suburb as a child, I got anywhere between three and 300 stars in the night sky. In my teens, we lived half an hour outside Frankfurt, Germany, where the sky wasn't much better. It didn't matter. I looked up in every clear night. By the time I got a car, I would drive two hours to find the darkest sky possible. Around the same time, I flew in a small propeller plane for the first time. It was all cockpit and I was in the right seat. We accelerated across the bumpy grass runway and leapt into the sky, the ground falling away beneath us. I was hooked. Flying was all I would talk about, and my dad took me to get my first lesson at the local airfield. From that point on, I got one hour of flight training each month as a kind of allowance. I dreamt first of becoming a pilot, then an astronaut. After finishing school, I made the cut for one of the most prestigious pilot cadet programs in the world. Many of the things I'd learned from astronomy helped me immensely. My spatial sense, working with technology, understanding weather. After four years of grueling studies and exhausting training, I started flying jet airliners. When you learn to fly by instruments and spend a lot of time in the simulator, your focus is on the technology within arm's reach. But as I joined the workforce and flew one flight after the other between major European cities, 
My view widened from the display's gauges, buttons, and knobs inside to the world passing by outside. I marveled at the Russian taiga. I soaked up the massive vista of the Alps, and I was mesmerized by the thousands of Greek islands. When the sun set, I turned my eyes to the stars, planets, and man-made satellites orbiting our planet. It was the astronauts that inspired me to take my photography up to cruising altitude. I'd thought about it for a while and came to the conclusion that the same rules apply to taking pictures from the airplanes and from the space station. This image in the style of Don Pettit is a long exposure that shows the stars rise and the bright city lights of Russia pass below as we fly eastbound through a turbulent sky. Since NASA photos are made possible by tax dollars, they are available for free to the public, right down to the EXIF data containing all the camera settings. It was an open book, and I was learning again. When you watch the ISS in the sky, you notice it appears to pass at the same speed as an airplane. Actually, it's 40 times faster, but it's also 40 times higher, so the angular velocity is the same. When we reverse our view and look down at the Earth from above, the landscape passes by at the same apparent speed from a plane and from low Earth orbit. There is just 40 times as much of it when you're on the space station. That means that a shutter speed short enough to show pictures of the night Earth from orbit without motion blur will also work on an airplane. In this photo taken from space by astronaut Terry Wirtz, you can see not only France in its entirety, but at least a dozen other European countries. At the left edge, that's the UK. Right across the English Channel are the Netherlands, Luxembourg and Belgium. A whole country lit up bright as a city with its illuminated motorways. You can see Spain on the right and all the way to Italy far off in the distance. I don't zoom over this landscape in three minutes like the men and women in space. It takes me two hours to get from London to Rome. From my stratospheric point of view, the world at night looks like this. The lights of London in the evening twilight on departure. Brussels and half of Belgium looking back towards the United Kingdom. Paris, France, the Eiffel Tower casting a beacon of light over the city of love. And Barcelona, Spain, with its perfect grid-like pattern of streets crossed by wide avenues. Night photography at 600 miles an hour is challenging. It's one frame out of a hundred where the air is smooth enough to reveal pinpoint stars. And of course there's the matter of work. Don't forget that I'm not there to take pictures. The majority of magical moments lands only on my retina, not my camera sensor. Far away from the city lights, I get views of the aurora borealis. But every time I fly over populated land, I become acutely aware of what's going on below, because two things make these views possible. Being above all that muck in the lower troposphere, and being far away from this. Every single photon that reached the sensor of my camera for this photo is wasted light, wasted energy. From the darkest sky imaginable, you can see around 4,500 stars. If you live in a typical suburban area, that number drops by 90% to 450. Head to the center of a big city, you lose another 90%. Chances are, when you're standing in Times Square, you won't see a single star. More than 80% of our planet's land areas have such light-polluted skies that the Milky Way cannot be seen. In the United States and Europe, this affects 99% of the population. Only 2 out of 10 people on Earth can see our home galaxy. The night sky has been an inspiration, a guide, a source of comfort for countless generations. We are among the first to deny our children this natural heritage. Beautiful as they may be, 
These photos show the permanent twilight we live in, oblivious of the beauty above that we have drowned out with our lighting. Just one century ago, everyone could see magnificent night skies by stepping out their front door. Now, the night is a hundred or thousands of times brighter. Light makes us feel safer, but bad light actually decreases safety. Light at night disturbs our body's natural rhythms, increasing risks for obesity, depression, sleep disorders, cancer, and more. Light pollution turns night into day for nocturnal animals with deadly effects. Light from unshielded or poorly aimed outdoor lighting costs $3 billion per year worth of energy lost to sky glow. The next time you're on a night flight, I encourage you to connect with your inner child and to build that fortress of blankets. Come fly with me.